Hello, everyone. This is Dave Farnsworth uh, with the Regulatory Assistance Project. I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar. It's entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Visions for a Clean Heat Standard. We're going to be exploring some complex questions about clean energy transition that's underway in the US. This transition has challenged utility regulators and energy industry members to ensure that the movement away from fossil fuel dominated resources and the adoption of lower carbon resources in their place will not put at risk the economic benefits, security and reliability associated with our current energy mix. As part of this transition, states across the country are exploring ways to lower emissions associated with a particular category of energy demand, building heat. We're going to start broadly today with Rich Cowart, the principal at RAP, and a former Vermont utility regulator. Rich will be dis, uh, framing the discussion for us today with a presentation called Clean Heat Standards, New Tools for the Thermal Challenge. We will then hear from Stephen Dodge, who's Director of State Regulatory Affairs at the Clean Fuels Alliance America. Steve will be discussing biofuels trends in New England and the Mid-Atlantic states. Our next speaker will be Aaron Overturf, who is the Clean Energy Program Director with Western Resource Advocates. Aaron will be sharing perspectives from the West, looking at activity in Nevada, in Colorado, and sharing her thoughts on ensuring carbon accountability. Following those three presenters, we're very fortunate to have Commissioner Megan Gilman of the Colorado PUC. Commissioner Gilman will assume the role of respondent, adding an additional dimension to this discussion and sharing her reactions and insights on today's topic. So before we start, I have a few uh, housekeeping points uh, I'd like to make. Due to the number of you on the webinar today, you're all muted. However, you'll be able to submit questions through the Zoom Q&A function. We'd like you to use that instead of the chat. So questions through Q&A instead of the chat. Uh, upon completion of the presentations, and once we hear from the respondent, we'll begin to address the questions you all have submitted, and we'll do our best to get to as many of them as possible. Now, just before the top of the hour, we will end the formal webinar, but if there are additional questions, we're happy to continue for an, uh, an additional 30 minutes. In order for folks who are unable to attend today to be able to enjoy this presentation, we're going to be recording it. And along with the presenter's slides in a few days, we'll be sending you a link to that recording. So I think that, uh, that wraps it up and we can get started. So Rich Cowart, microphone's yours. All right, uh, Dave, thanks very much. and. Uh, to everybody, I'm really happy to be here to talk about such a really interesting, challenging, emerging problem. Uh, I have two goals today. One is to sort of set the stage about clean heat standards generally, what do they involve? And secondly, to um, give you a little insight into the Vermont proposal for a clean heat standard, which is still pending. Um, but we've done a lot of learning by going through the process in Vermont, and I'll share a little bit of that. Um, Dave, uh, or Donna, next slide. So um, just by a prelude, probably everybody on this call is aware of the fact, but I, I sometimes need to remind the legislators um, that this is a really tough challenge. Um, heat is obviously an important contributor to our climate emissions. Um, we're going to be talking today primarily about space heating in buildings, water heating in buildings, but industrial process heat is also uh, a, a major challenge. Large reductions are required to meet the emission reduction requirements in a number of states um, and nationally, and climate science tells us these requirements are real. As we make this important transition, we need from the very beginning to build in equity as part and parcel of the program, its purposes, and its uh, techniques. And uh, you know, this adds a special dimension to um, the challenge in, in front of us. Buildings, I say, are hard and slow. They're hard because 
unlike, uh, say, a renewable portfolio standard where the action can take place at the utility side of the transmission line, um, change in heating um, will, to a significant degree, have to take place in individual buildings owned by individual uh, families and businesses, uh, something in the tune of 70 million homes and 30 million um, commercial buildings in the United States that will need to be converted or served with new and different fuels. Uh, buildings are slow, and here we should just compare to, say, the automobile fleet. The automobile fleet turns over much faster than the building fleet, and the typical uh, heating appliance in a building lasts a lot longer than a typical automobile. And so unlike with uh, automobile fuel efficiency and fleet turnover programs, uh, buildings are just a lot slower. And therefore, we need to design policies that will accelerate what would otherwise be the normal pace of change in the sector. Uh, next slide. I think everybody here is pretty well aware of the fact that home heat in the US is predominantly fossil still. Um, electricity it has a major fraction in the Southeast in particular, but for the most part, we're talking about natural gas um, and then about 9% of home heating is propane and fuel oil. Um, heat pumps are still a small fraction of the heating mix in the U.S. So we have a long ways to go. Next slide. What is the clean heat standard? The, the basic idea is to create a performance standard that would require obligated parties. And we start off thinking about the providers of fossil heating fuels but I put that in brackets to indicate that the obligated parties uh, might be defined differently in different places. They should deliver a gradually increasing percentage of low emission heating services to customers. It's just kind of like the renewable portfolio standard um, as it grows over time. We know there are a lot of potential clean heat resources um, and to the clean heat standard is designed to be technologically neutral, perhaps not entirely technologically neutral, but significantly so, so that customers and providers will have a lot of choices. Next slide. The good news about performance standards is that we have a lot of experience with them in the US in the energy realm. We have renewable um, electricity standards, a lot of experience with that, energy efficiency standards, added dimension because the EE standards have shown that we can in fact reach and work with end use customers. And um, low carbon fuel standards now, clean heat in Vermont, clean heat in Colorado, which we're going to talk about. There's lots of experience to draw on in the performance standard world. Next slide. What are the basic architectural elements of the clean heat standard? Now I'm gonna drive you nuts here because there on two slides, um, there are 13 different architectural elements that we learned we needed to go through to design the clean heat standard uh, that we've been working on in, in Vermont and now more recently in Massachusetts. Um, on this slide, I'm just going to ask you to more or less read it and we may refer back to it later, but the essential elements are what in fact is the obligation? How do you define it? Who will be obligated to perform? How fast? How can we build equity into the program? What actions earn credits? What's actually considered to be clean? And should we put some guardrails in the program to either exclude certain kinds of potential heat sources as undesirable, or to promote certain heat sources because we really want to see them developed. Um, next slide, Donna. Um, on this slide, um, additional program elements, 
I'm going to focus your attention on item nine. A clean heat standard would will necessarily exist in the context of a lot of other climate and energy policies, and uh, including climate and energy policies that are aimed at reducing emissions from the thermal sector. So the question is, how do would those all work together? Um, next slide. Now, very quickly, I'm going to talk about three. Um, specific elements of the Vermont proposal. Next slide. So in the Vermont proposal, which recently um, passed both houses of the Vermont legislature with very strong votes, but was vetoed by the governor, uh, we learned quite a lot in the design of the proposal that I think will be coming back to the legislature uh, in the next session. The focus of the obligation in Vermont was on greenhouse gas emissions. We, we decided we would count tons and that this was the focus of our Global Warming Solutions Act. That's what we're after. The obligated parties included in Vermont, both the gas utility and the delivered fuel dealers. Um, it's, Vermont is different from most of the US in that about 75% of the uh, heat in Vermont is not from pipeline gas, it's from delivered fuels. Importantly, credits are earned by actions at customer locations that reduce emissions. So think about customers, uh, we're measuring what happens in Vermont at customer locations. Next slide. Then we had to ask, well, what actions will actually earn credits? Um, there, are, there are a lot of ways to reduce emissions from the thermal sector, and we wanted to make sure that, that there was a lot of flexibility for consumers and for providers to choose different pathways. Uh, I've listed a few of them here. Weatherization and heat pumps are the uh, number one, number two choices, of course. Certain biofuels would qualify, low carbon district heating, solar thermal, in the long term, perhaps renewable hydrogen. We recognize that customer choice is essential to acceptance. That is, individual customers are going to have to make choices um, in order for clean heat to work. And finally, anyone can earn credits. Sometimes people think, well, you have a clean heat standard with obligations on um, the providers, so only providers can earn credits. We thought otherwise. We thought, hey, an energy efficiency provider or a weatherization contractor ought to be able to earn credits too, and then they become uh, marketable under this program. Next slide. In the debates over the Vermont Clean Heat Standard, we learned that a number of guardrails are really essential. And I would recommend these to anybody. First, we um, ensured that a high fraction of clean heat solutions would, would be um, delivered to low and moderate income households. We made sure that credits would be measured on a net life cycle basis so that if you're measuring tons, let's measure real tons real tons saved. Um, credits are only earned for measures that are actually delivered in Vermont. You, you know, as we used to say, you know, you're not going to plant trees in China and claim clean heat credits under the Vermont system. And um, only sustainably sourced biofuels uh, under the legislation would earn credits. And finally, we, we made sure that long life measures would um, be able to earn credits over the long life of those measures. Next slide. I'll just, I'll conclude here with why I think we need a clean heat standard. Um, I started with consumers, I'm gonna end with consumers. Building owners, for the most part, are going to need to make significant changes in order to reduce emissions. It could be buying uh, cleaner fuels, but in many cases, it will be changing out their heating systems. 
or weatherizing their buildings. Um, fossil providers under a clean heat standard will be given the opportunity to adapt their business models. They can sell different products. They can sell uh, entirely different lines of products. We can build in equity from the outset. And finally, we're doing, we're taking significant progress nationwide to clean up the electric system. And for years and years and years, we have let the fossil system, heating system, uh, just to, um, continue to emit and, and to grow emissions in many cases um, without bringing them into the clean energy transition. And it's just time now to turn to the uh, thermal sector as, uh, together with the electricity sector to, re to reduce emissions. Thanks, Dave. That's it for now. Thank you, Rich. Stephen Dodge, uh, the microphone's yours. Great, thank you, David. And uh, thanks for the invitation to this uh, great panel. It's great to uh, be able to speak with, uh, with you folks and, and, and looking over the list of those who've registered, it's really impressive. So uh, I hope I can kind of fill the void here if, if uh, you have one on uh, biofuels and biodiesel and what exactly it is and what's happening in some of the other states. I won't talk about Vermont because Richard has obviously covered Vermont, but I'll talk about what, what's happening in some of the other states. Um, next slide. <clears throat> I do have a fair number of slides. I'll try to go through them fairly quickly. Um, so don't really raise your hand either on Zoom or figuratively, but it, raise your hand if, if, you've, if you've heard of the uh, National Biodiesel Board because that's who we are. Uh, Clean Fuels Alliance America uh, up until we changed our name just in January, uh, but up until then, uh, for the past almost 30 years, we've been the National Biodiesel Board. And we changed our name to really represent kind of the full suite of members that we now have um, and the full suite of fuels, of biodiesel type fuels that we now, our members produce. And they include uh, biodiesel, renewable diesel, uh, which is very similar uh, to biodiesel only it is refined as opposed to blended like biodiesel bioheat which is really a trademark trademarked um, uh, name for biodiesel and sustainable aviation fuel as well so our members cover really the i used to say the entire food chain i'm a little sensitive to saying that now because particularly in vermont there was some pushback uh, on the food versus fuel argument and i will address that in a few minutes but we really uh, represent the entire distribution chain of farmers, uh, producers or feedstock, blenders, distributors, and users of, of biofuels. Uh, and again, particularly biodiesel, renewable diesel, and sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, next slide. And for those who may not be familiar with uh, biodiesel, um, it is made from an increasingly diverse mix of resources such as recycled cooking oil, soybean oil, uh, animal fats, uh, and we really feel that we are in, particularly when you talk about a clean heat standard, like has been discussed in Vermont and like many other states as well, and I'll get to that, uh, we re really feel that we're in a sweet spot because we do not believe, uh, or I should say we do believe that electrification is an important pathway to immediate carbon reductions. But as Richard pointed out, there are many areas that cannot be electrified immediately. That's the medium and heavy duty transportation sector, and it's also the thermal heat sector. And we feel that biodiesel uh, is a viable product that is available, that is cost competitive, uh, and it is a drop in fuel that can be used immediately with very little, if any, modification on the home heating side. And so um, that is what our, my job is, quite frankly, is to try to convince policymakers that biodiesel should be uh, at the table. And by the way, EPA does designate biodiesel as a, a high quality advanced biofuel uh, because it helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions depending on the feedstocks and the blends, anywhere between 57 and 86%. Uh, next slide. So what's driving the bus really, no uh, uh, pun intended here, and that is the states. We know what's happening, uh, particularly on both coasts. Um, this is kind of an interesting way to look at it. Um, I came across the slide uh, last week and I haven't updated it, but I, I, my sense is that there may be a few changes in some of the states, but at least by 20, as of 2020, over half of the United States population lived in states that had an aggressive carbon reduction goal or a mandate. And that also covered 
more than half of the US GDP, more than 40% of the on-road fuel, and 90%, over 90% of the home heating oil uh, fuel. And <clears throat> as you know, really, uh, our area of the country, uh, the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, uh, has a few spots in the upper Northwest, but we are kind of the focal point for uh, heating fuels, heating oil uh, here in the Northeast uh, for heat. Uh, next slide. Uh, biodiesel is not something that is a new product. Uh, it's been made ASTM certified for years. Uh, in 2020, uh, the state market was one, a little less than 2 billion gallons. Uh, by 2030, we project looking at the state mandates that are already in place, uh, that there'll be a demand for over 5 billion gallons. Um, and you can see what's really driving the bus is the low carbon fuel standard in California um, there. Uh, next, oh, I should also say that um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, as of 2021, there are 3.2 billion gallons of biodiesel that was sold, manufactured and sold in the United States. EIA predicts that will go up to 6 billion gallons by 2030. Uh, and then we predict that uh, the market will be 15 billion gallons by 2050. Uh, next slide. And as I mentioned before, soy is the primary feedstock uh, for biodiesel. Uh, animal fats are second. Used cooking oil went down a bit during the pandemic, but it's gone up a bit um, and is now the third largest uh, uh, feedstock, uh, followed by Desilus corn oil, canola, uh, and others. Next slide. And again, back to my earlier point about biodiesel really being in a sweet spot. We know that all the states are looking, turning over every rock to try to come up with ways to immediately reduce carbon emissions and their carbon footprint. And biodiesel uh, produces on average 80% reduction in carbon emissions compared to petroleum-based diesel. And that's from a full life cycle analysis. That's GREET, that's argon, that's CARB, uh, that's the EPA. And, and the other thing um, that I think it's important to note is that we're really talking about uh, anthropogenic carbon, or as I like to say, recycled carbon uh, that's converted com um, uh, produced with the combustion of biofuels as opposed to biogenic carbon, which is produced from the combustion of petroleum-based uh, fuels. And that is a new source of carbon. Anthropogenic biodiesel burnt carbon is recycled carbon. Next slide. And I could spend a lot of time on the whole food for versus fuel argument. Uh, this came up during the debate on the clean heat standard in Vermont. Uh, but uh, we certainly know that used cooking oil and animal fats are waste products. But particularly with soy, which is the primary feedstock, 80% of the soy is used for protein, animal feed, food. 20% of that is the oil. And that is what is used to produce biodiesel. And prior to its use as a feedstock for biodiesel, that was a waste product. And that was the case with the other bean oils as well. It was taken to wastewater treatment plants. Um, so at least as far as biodiesel is concerned, food for fuel really isn't an argument, we believe. Next slide. And again, I think as most people on this webinar know that really state policies are driving uh, the, uh, uh, the, the use of biodiesel um, and the efforts to electrify both in the transportation, the building sector and the power generation sector. Um, and next slide. And again, Every state calls it something different, but every state really in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, probably with the exception of New Hampshire, uh, has very aggressive carbon reduction mandates. And when I look at the states in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, um, I may be missing some, but um, Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Maryland, Vermont, um, the carbon reductions are mandated. They are not goals. And um, in Massachusetts, uh, several years ago, um, back in 2016, several environmental groups sued the governor and said, Governor, you're treating these carbon reductions as, as goals and not mandates. And the state's highest court agreed. So states are really under the gun, as I said, to look under every rock to try, try to come up with um, carbon reduction pathways. Uh, next slide. And that's why we're focused really uh, on the Northeast heating oil market, which is fairly large. It's almost 4 billion gallons. Uh, New York being the largest, almost uh, over a million gallons there. Pennsylvania is number two, Massachusetts is number three. Maine uh, has the highest per capita of homes in the country uh, that use heating oil. Next slide. And 
you know, I kind of look at it as a chicken or an egg type analogy. Um, and when you look at, you know, EVs, when you look at heat pumps, when you look at the California low carbon fuel standard, what's it going to take to really make biofuels or any type of carbon intensive, less carbon intensive uh, fuel? Uh, what's going to bring that to the table? Um, what's going to make it accepted? Is it going to be the industry stepping up to the plate or is it going to be state mandates? And I really think the answer is both. Um, and in the case of state mandates, uh, we're looking at blending mandates. I'll talk about those in a minute, some of the states that have those. Tax incentives, low carbon fuel standard like California or a clean heat standard like Vermont's been looking at and other states, cap and invest, blending incentives. Uh, it's really the state policies that I think are going to drive the increased use of biodiesel. Um, and we believe that if there's a commitment uh, to demand, that supply will come. Next slide. And to that end, uh, several years ago, the liquid fuels heating industry, or the chicken, uh, came to the table and adopted a resolution. They call it the Providence Resolution because it was passed in Providence back in 2019 that really committed the industry, the liquid fuels heating uh, industry, to uh, a lower carbon footprint. Um, they set a goal of reducing their carbon emissions by 15% by 2023. That equates to a B20 uh, bioheat blend. 40% by 2030, which equates to a 2050 blend, and net zero by 2050, which equates to a B100 blend. Next slide. And just looking quickly at some of the states, a lot going on in New York, particularly with the CLCPA. I've just highlighted some of the things I want to point out in New York. Uh, very significant last year was the governor signing into law a bill that uh, creates a bioheat mandate starting actually in just a month of July 1st at B5. That expands a current mandate that's in effect for uh, New York City and about seven counties uh, in the New York City area. Uh, that ramps up to B10 by 2025, B20 by 2030. Um, and there's also a legislative proposal in New York to increase that mandate up to B50. Um, and uh, also in New York, both as a recommendation uh, before the Climate Action Council and also as separate legislation uh, is a proposal to enact a clean heat standard, clean fuel standard, both for transportation and for um, the thermal heat sector. Next slide. Last year, both Connecticut and Rhode Island passed bioheat mandates. Rhode Island actually passed the first bioheat mandate back in 2013, went up to two uh, B5 blends. Uh, their law last year increased that up to B50 by 2030. The Connecticut blending law also enacted both bills, ironically, were signed within about a week of each other, uh, establishes a B5 mandate this year and ramps up to B50 by 2035. When you put Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New York together, that's 40% of the heating oil market um, in the Northeast, so it's not insignificant. Uh, next slide. In Massachusetts, Massachusetts was really the first state in the country back in 2008 to adopt a biofuels mandate for both transportation and for the thermal heat sector, liquid fuels, um, that would have established a B5 mandate. Um, and that was suspended literally two days before it was supposed to take effect two, days, uh, uh, two years later in 2010 due to supply questions and uh, cost questions. That is something that the governor could undo with the stroke of the pen. We've been working with the fuel oil dealers in Massachusetts to try to convince the administration of that. It does not need legislative approval uh, to take effect. And when you look at what the carbon savings that could have occurred in Massachusetts, uh, if they had enacted that B5 blend starting back in 2010, uh, it is significant and we feel a missed opportunity. Uh, Massachusetts also has an aggressive uh, APS uh, blending incentive uh, that has um, displaced some 40 plus million gallons of petroleum based heating oil uh, over the last several years. And really what's happening in Massachusetts now and the focus is on a commission on clean heat, which has been charged with looking at ways to reduce pat, uh, carbon emissions from the building sector. And um, they are specifically also looking at a clean heat standard as well as a cap and invest program are also evaluating whether electricity ratepayer funded uh, programs should continue to be used to, uh, for liquid fuel infrastructure. And the other issue that we're watching closely, and this happened in Berlin and Vermont, it's happened in Ithaca 
uh, New York and other states, uh, started on the West Coast, moved to the East Coast, Brookline, Massachusetts, is communities that are trying to ban fossil fuel infrastructure. And of course, if you ban liquid fuel infrastructure, you're banning the use of bioheat fuel uh, in the future. Uh, next slide, and I'll wrap it up with these last two slides. Again, lots going on here in the, uh, in the states uh, with um, the states trying to develop pathways to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, probably the outlier state is New Hampshire, uh, which has a goal, uh, but it also passed a law uh, last year which pr protected consumers' rights to choose their home heating fuel. And Pennsylvania has a similar law pending. And last slide, I'll just talk about Maryland quickly because there was lots of action there. Maryland had a greenhouse gas reduction goal uh, law on the books passed a number of years ago. They kind of upped the ante, made it a, a mandate, uh, ending in a net zero statewide greenhouse gas emission uh, mandate by 2045. The original version of the bill had no reference to biodiesel or biofuels, and we work with the heating oil dealers in eliminating a fossil fuel ban that was in the original version of the bill and getting, a, uh, getting on the menu there uh, for an all electric building code and energy performance standards. Governor vetoed that bill. Uh, I'm sorry, he allowed it to become law without his signature. So lots going on in the states. Happy to answer more questions. And once again, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in the panel. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Aaron, take it away. Great. Um, thank you and good afternoon. My name is Aaron Overturf. And um, as Dave mentioned, I'm the director of the Clean Energy Program at Western Resource Advocates. Next slide, please. For those of you that aren't familiar with WRA, we are a regional conservation nonprofit working exclusively in the interior west of the United States. WRA's clean energy program is made up of lawyers, engineers, economists, and policy experts working to move the west to a clean energy future. Next slide. So today I'll be discussing Nevada's Assembly Bill 380, a gas utility planning bill that was proposed but not adopted in the 2021 legislative session. And I'll also be discussing Colorado's Senate Bill 264, a clean heat standard for gas distribution utilities that was adopted in 2021. There are currently a number of open Colorado PUC proceedings related to implementation of that law. And so I will not be discussing those so as to avoid putting Commissioner Gilman in an uncomfortable position as today's respondent. I've also seen some important and complex greenhouse gas accounting issues arise in the context of clean heat standards. And so I'll briefly touch on those as well. Next slide, please. So first, let's talk about Nevada. Nevada already has a state policy goal to reduce statewide greenhouse gas emissions at least 28% by 2025 and 45% by 2030 as compared to 2005 levels. It also has a goal to ultimately achieve zero or near zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Residential and commercial use of fossil methane gas accounts for about 9% of Nevada's overall greenhouse gas emissions. And the state has recognized that transitioning away from natural gas is necessary for the state to achieve its broader climate goals. So against this backdrop, Assembly Bill 380 was introduced, again, but not approved in 2021. So that bill would have set goals to reduce the net greenhouse gas emissions from the use of combustible fuels in commercial and residential buildings. And it also would have directed the Nevada Public Utilities Commission to open an investigatory proceeding into the topic of gas system transition with an explicit directive to investigate the topics listed here on the slide. And I'll just note that while this legislation did not ultimately pass, the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada has independently commenced a pretty robust investigation into some of these same issues and that's ongoing now. Next slide, please. The real heart of the Nevada proposal was the requirement that gas utilities file infrastructure, supply, and alternatives plans with the Public Utilities Commission. These plans would need to present a long-term look at the system, as well as a shorter-term action plan designed to put the utility on a pathway to comply with the greenhouse gas reduction targets. There are also requirements to bring forward alternative plans for the Commission's evaluation. The bill also would have repealed an existing provision in Nevada law that classifies gas utility infrastructure expansion as an economic development program for certain purposes. While Assembly Bill 380 was not ultimately successful, 
it's clear that Nevada will need to craft a strategy to reduce emissions from the use of fossil methane in homes and businesses if it wants to achieve its broader climate goals. So I'd expect to see more discussion around this topic in Nevada in the future. So next slide, please. Now let's turn to Colorado, my beautiful home state. So Colorado adopted economy-wide greenhouse gas reduction goals back in 2019, which direct the state to reduce emissions 26% by 2025 and 50% by 2030 as compared to 2005 levels. Then the state of Colorado developed a greenhouse gas reduction roadmap, which identified sector specific emission reduction trajectories that would be necessary to achieve these broader statewide goals, including specifically um, reductions in emissions from the combustion of fossil methane in homes and businesses. So in 2021, Colorado's clean heat standard was adopted. And this legislation establishes greenhouse gas reduction goals for gas distribution utilities. And those goals are aligned with the roadmap's sector specific trajectory, including a 5% reduction by 2025 and a 22% reduction by 2030. The bill requires gas distribution utilities to file clean heat plans that lay out how they plan to achieve these emission reduction standards using clean heat resources, such as efficiency, electrification, green hydrogen, and recovered methane. Now, recovered methane is a unique defined term that includes what you could also describe as alternative sources of methane. So these are things like biomethane, abandoned coal mine methane, and methane leaks from the utilities pipeline system. Next slide, please. Now, notably, the bill establishes a cap on how much of this recovered methane can be used to meet the greenhouse gas reduction goals. And this is a really key component of the policy design because we need to make sure that this policy is leading to direct emission reductions that are aligned with the state's broader roadmap. And by direct emission reductions, I mean reductions in the CO2 emissions that are created on the customer's premises when the gas purchased from the utility is combusted and consumed. Recovered methane does not reduce these direct emissions. Instead, it avoids methane emissions that arguably would have occurred elsewhere in the economy. But even if your methane comes from a dairy farm, it's still creating CO2 when it's burned. So over-reliance on recovered methane has the potential to cannibalize the direct emission reductions that the roadmap says we need from this sector. And the policy therefore strikes a balance between encouraging methane capture and creating a market for recovered methane by using it as a compliance tool while still preventing this potential crowding out of other strategies that reduce direct emissions. Gas distribution utilities are also directed to prioritize investments that ensure that the benefits of the programs flow to disproportionately impacted communities and income qualified residential customers as part of the clean heat plan. And notably, Colorado's clean heat standard also requires a level of cooperation between utility regulators and air regulators, something that we're seeing more and more of as we deal with these complex decarbonization policies that really require the expertise of multiple state agencies working together. So I've highlighted some of their tasks here on the slide. And to conclude, I'd like to spend just a few more minutes um, discussing some of the important greenhouse gas accounting issues that arise from these policies. So why are we doing all of this? <laughs> why are we undertaking the complex work of building these new policy frameworks? It's about reducing emissions, reducing the pollution that drives climate change and harms our health. And if we're not actually reducing the tons of carbon, methane, or conventional pollutants, then what are we even doing? <laughs> why are we here? So that's why my plea to you is to A, always, B, B, C, counting the carbon. For those of you that don't recognize this, it's from, oh, can you go back to that slide? Um, it's from the great movie, Glen Gary, Glen Ross, which also includes the other iconic, li iconic line that coffee is for closers. And the same way that they only get coffee if they close the sale, we will only get a healthy livable climate if we actually factually reduce the tons that we're putting into the atmosphere. And that means being diligent and scrupulous about greenhouse gas accounting and verification of claimed emission reductions. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. So as my colleagues could tell you, I could yammer on about greenhouse gas accounting all day, but I will not subject you to that. Instead, I wanna just highlight a few of the key issues. Um, the first is around baselines. So both the Colorado and the Nevada policies that we discussed today have percentage-based emission reduction targets, which means you need to assess which emissions are in your baseline and ensure that that matches up with the universe of reductions that are eligible as compliance tools. If there's a mismatch, such as, for example, when you're using indirect emission reductions, like what Colorado calls recovered methane, then you need to be diligent to avoid double counting and create some sort of crediting and tracking system to follow these emission reductions around. Um, the second, which we've already talked about, is recognizing that alternative methane sources are indirect emission reduction tools and require special care to ensure that crediting is being done in a way that's accurate and reliable. At the end of the day, a lot of this comes down to preventing double counting of emission reductions. Double counting can occur if your baselines are not appropriately crafted, if you're allowing the same emission reductions to count for multiple compliance obligations, or if you're not careful about the treatment of any severable credits or other tradable instruments that represent avoided emissions attributes. Next slide, please. While it's a bit tangentially related, um, any policy that allows for the use of offsets or claimed negative emissions can have their own challenges around ensuring additionality and performance and permanence, and they can exacerbate existing environmental inequities. And I just want to call your attention to this recent article by Jessica Fu in Grist, which looks at similar emissions accounting issues and double counting issues um, in the context of California dairy emissions. It's not exactly about a clean heat standard, but it's a really thoughtful look at these complex issues and is worth a read. Next slide, please. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Erin, very much. Uh, let me remind folks, please submit your questions and we will be getting to them shortly. Commissioner Gilman, welcome again. Thank you for being willing to uh, provide attendees with your thoughts about this topic and about what you've heard today. Looking forward to your comments. Yeah, well, thank you for having me, David, and thanks to all the panelists for all the great information shared today. Um, you know, I, I think Richard kind of hit on um, the point of what a fundamental challenge decarbonizing heat is going to be as part of our holistic energy transition. Um, and certainly that's something we're facing head on now in Colorado. Uh, I was fortunate, actually, a lot of my background was in the building industry and in building energy use. So um, not, not too far from my wheelhouse, some of what we're discussing uh, as options, but um, really a fundamental challenge. And as we look and kind of compare and contrast it to what we see in the electric transition, um, first of all, we've been working uh, a, significant, uh, a significantly longer amount of time on the electric transition. And also, I think we have some really promising, um, promising cost drivers there. We have lower cost commodities, uh, oftentimes on the renewable side, as well as a lot of signs for load growth as we electrify loads, uh, both of which look to put uh, downward pressure on rates on the electric side. Um, and at this point in this transition, you know, you, you can't see the same exact promising signals in terms of alternative commodities um, or load changes on the, uh, on the heating side. And so it's just a fundamental challenge. A lot of people may not have predicted that, you know, 20 years ago or so on the electric side. So everything can change. Um, but where we sit right now, um, there are some fundamental challenges here as we move forward. Um, but getting to kind of our obligation, I mean, in Colorado, we have a clear legal obligation given our legislation um, sets out specific uh, requirements for our LDCs to reduce uh, greenhouse gases. But of course, we all have a moral obligation as we move forward as well to ensure uh, that we're doing as much as possible to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I think, uh, you know, hearing the presentations today, uh, I see clean heat standards as one tool, right? They set important guidelines. Aaron went over a lot of the guidelines in Colorado, which I think was helpful to set the stage. So these important guidelines help us understand the ultimate uh, destination and a few of the rules of the road. So in Colorado, uh, they established things like um, uh, some, some legally enshrined kind of starting points for how, how we do this and where we are. 
Um, first of all, customer emissions are the responsibility of the LDCs. So those emissions that are counted go from the city gate uh, up through and including the customer end use emissions. Um, you know, I don't think that was clear in terms of emission counting before uh, our legislation, how those would be treated. Um, there are specific emission reductions and timelines. There are eligible resources that Aaron went over that the legislature envisioned. Um, and that all of this should be done in a transparent, adjudicated way uh, publicly at the commission that would allow competition between essentially portfolios of options as we move forward. So that's what we know with the clean heat standard, but they, they don't actually, nor should they, nor could they give us all of the insights we need to understand how this transition will really look as it plays out and as regulators to ensure that our utilities are still able to maintain safe, reliable, and affordable flow of natural gas uh, to those who continue to rely on it to heat their homes as we're in the midst uh, of this decarbonization. Um, so anecdotally, something I, I know that's of a lot of concern are the equity concerns, especially if we were to see uh, increasing costs or increasing shares of costs on the system, on fewer customers, that those customers maybe disproportionately uh, lower income customers. Um, and so of course that's something that's of uh, a lot of concern, especially to regulators in ensuring we have uh, a good vision, a good understanding of how we think uh, this transition uh, to lower carbon, either sources uh, or uses within a home will be managed as we move forward. Um, and so to understand how equity is properly prioritized, how we affect effectively regulate these utilities going th forward through um, really changes like we haven't seen in that industry before. I think many regulators are really interested in understanding, um, uh, getting into better focus, what this may look like on our systems. How do we execute on this now that we have the clean heat standard in Colorado? What does it look like as it plays out? Um, how do we avoid, uh, investing in multiple costly options, perhaps in the same exact area, kind of overlapping investments, um, understanding how we safely um, introduce alternative fuels like hydrogen into pipelines that were not maybe initially designed um, for that, um, to understand the upcoming loads and upcoming investments that we may see coming from natural gas utility, uh, our, our LDC utilities. So we uh, get a better picture moving forward on how we might see loads changing, on how we might see rates changing um, as we go forward. Um, and really, how do we align how we regulate these companies, how we view upcoming investments and their financial treatment with what we see as the most likely future for the systems, given all of the inputs we know. And I think it's probably false to think at some point it will be crystal clear and we'll know. These are all pieces of the puzzle that we're gathering to become uh, clearer and clearer about what the future may look like here, how we best regulate this to ensure, of course, that we're protecting ratepayers and ensuring that the system um, and, and that however folks heat their homes um, remains affordable to them and reliable to them, um, you know, really, I think, as a, as a fundamental duty of ours. So um, in this vein, I think the clean heat standards we've talked about today, um, I think there are kind of interesting different architectures, um, you know, and I think Richard laid out a lot of kind of the fundamental um, parts of it. Um, but for, for us at the commission, they're in a way a starting point, not the ending point, right? That, that's what we get given. And then we're going to move forward and say, okay, well, what does this look like as we implement it? And as we, as we look forward 20 years, 30 years, which is not fundamentally something that's been done um, on the LDC side of things, we don't in Colorado have currently long-term planning processes in place. Um, so as part of our rules implementing our clean heat standards, we've expanded those to include a broader gas planning effort to really allow us to fill in some of these gaps and say, what is the best understanding we can get of how some of this looks as we play it out um, so that we can better understand the impacts on customers and the impacts on the system. Um, so um, I, I just to piggyback maybe one more thought on something Aaron said, um, we are definitely seeing, I think, an increased need to coordinate with other state agencies, as she identified. Um, 
while while we uh, I think are are recognized as the state experts in utilities, we are not necessarily in greenhouse gas emissions, particularly. So um, it's important for us to know what we know and what we don't know. And so we've actually partnered with um, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, which is our state agency who is generally um, focused more on the greenhouse gas accounting and emissions side of things in their um, air quality and air pollution um, divisions. And so um, we've tried to partner with them um, knowing we are not the experts at how exactly the greenhouse gas reduction should be counted, should be accounted for. And there is so much to do um, that, that luckily they were able to help us um, at this point in that scope um, so that we didn't make a big mistake. Because as Aaron said, I mean, the devil's in the details. We need to be sure things are properly accounted for. And so in that uh, respect, we are getting some help from other state agencies, which I think is very helpful. So um, those are some of my thoughts now, David. Hopefully that was helpful, but uh, happy to engage as we move forward. Thank you very much. No, those are very interesting comments. Loads of, loads of interesting um, things to discuss. So Colorado has experience in the clean, clean Air, Clean Jobs Act from maybe six or eight years ago where the, um, where the utility regulator works with the air regulator. Um, that's encouraging to hear that you're, you're working towards that. Um, uh, that coordination with that agency makes sense to me. Well, listen, we've got a lot of questions here. What I'd like to do is maybe toss out, uh, I'm gonna put a couple of questions together and um, toss it out to all of you. Um, so just raise your hand if you're, if you're interested in, in talking about it or uh, responding to it or just start responding to it. Um, the first one, the first part of the question is, could you compare a clean heat standard to other performance standards? And do you think of the clean heat standard as a necessary policy to decarbonize the building sector? Or is it just one strategy among many? Rich. Well, I'll, I'll start with that. I'm sure the others will have good thoughts. Um, it's not absolutely necessary to adopt a clean heat standard in order to decarbonize the building sector. There are, of course, a lot of other policies that we could use. Um, and, but it is worth you know, pausing for a moment to ask about the relative effectiveness of a clean heat standard, at least to begin the process as compared with um, a carbon tax, for example, or a cap and trade system. The problem with the tax or the cap and trade system is that they, they tend to operate by imposing higher prices on consumers. And the barriers to change in the building sector are sufficiently high that driving change that way requires a really high price. And so if you look at the price elasticity of demand numbers for heating fuels, you, you don't get very rapid change um, through a, a, a tax or a cap, which ends up operating like a tax. So a performance standard that helps customers change is uh, an important part of the picture, particularly if you want heat pumps to be the dominant answer. So um, I think it's important to have a performance standard that is um, designed to help customers change their heating systems um, as part of the package. Now that can, that can work alongside a cap and invest program or um, a weatherization program or uh, uh, building codes and appliance standards. There's all kinds of complementary policies that need to work together. But a performance standard for clean heat is a, uh, could be a central policy mechanism. Can I, can I go next? You certainly um, can. So I'll just highlight that in Colorado in the 2021 legislative session when the clean heat standard was adopted, it was just one of many policies aimed at reducing emissions from the sector. 
There was also a building electrification requirement new for our electric utilities. There were updates to our gas demand side management programs and statutes. And then just this year, we saw additional legislation around building codes and other efforts that are going to reduce emissions from the system. So I really agree with Richard that I think it's one tool in the toolbox. Um, but what I will say is that I think it's an incredibly valuable overarching policy that gives broader direction to regulators and to the utilities themselves about what are we aiming for? I think we all know that we need to reduce emissions from this sector, um, particularly for states that have economy-wide greenhouse gas reduction goals. We know we need to be reducing emissions, but how much and by when for this particular sector? And that's one of the key sort of policy directives that I think a clean heat candor a clean heat standard can provide to interested parties. Thank you, Aaron. Stephen? Can I just add this? And here's kind of the practical problem you have when you have an area of the country like ours that uses four billion gallons a year of liquid fuels. Uh, and that is, and I just kind of go back to my own example. A year ago last January, my heating system died. My fossil fuel-based heating system died. It was 20 degrees out. I was working from home. My wife was working from home. My daughter was taking classes from home. I needed to get that system replaced as soon as possible. When I need a new car, gets 150,000, my case 250,000 miles on it. I say, yeah, it's about time for me to buy a car. Most people don't do that with their furnace. They replace it when it dies. And it usually dies in the middle of the winter when they don't have a lot of luxury to start tearing their system apart. In my case, um, I have a, a forced hot water system. If I would have put a heat pump in, it would have required me taking that entire system out, the pipes and everything, and, and replacing it. So I, I'm guess what? I'm baked into fossil fuels for the next you know, 20, 30 years or however long I own a house. And that's really kind of the practical problem you have here. So because we are so dependent on liquid fuels and will be for the foreseeable future, it really makes sense to adopt some type of heat standard, performance standard, that would ratchet down the carbon intensity of those liquid fuels. Thanks, Stephen. Commissioner Gilman, anything to add? No, I mean, I, I would probably second just about everything that's been said. I, I'm Since I'm not on the legislative side of this, I, I'm sure there are other tools, um, but but you know we're using what we have and, and what's been given. And I would agree with Aaron. I think it's given us a longer term view and a wider view that is very helpful as regulators to say, where are we ultimately going with this? And I should say there are uh, targets, our, our target reductions from 2035 on have yet to be set. Those will be set by the commission uh, later on um, in a proceeding. But having that big view is, is really helpful. Um, for us as a commission, because, you know, before we had this legislation, I joined the commission in 2020, you know, and you're looking at prudency reviews of different gas expenditures and you're like, I, I don't know. I don't know what's prudent because I don't know what the future of the system looks like and how do we um, calibrate that in our minds. And so it provides one step, as I articulated before, there's a lot more that needs to happen to really understand what the system looks like as we move forward. But I think it provides a, a crucial step for us in Colorado in understanding what the bigger picture is that we're working towards. Thank you. Well, for folks who didn't think this was gonna be a densely packed topic, uh, you know, there you go. Here we are almost at the top of the hour. So let me, let me provide a few takeaways. Um, clean heat standards, a flexible policy, obviously can be designed in many different ways. From what we've heard about out, out west and the needs there, what we've heard about uh, Vermont, Massachusetts, and other places in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic states, it's a flexible tool that can meet a number of needs based on policymakers' uh, specific needs. Um, it can in incorporate many different resources, supply and demand side resources, and it can complement existing state policies. It's really important for regulators to incorporate full life cycle greenhouse gas emission analysis to make sure that um, the books aren't getting cooked when it comes to doing the carbon accounting. Not a small challenge. Um, and the last thing that strikes me, and it's, it's, it's important here because many people are, are, are very questioning about continuing to combust anything to meet climate goals. Um, if you're choosing clean heat, if you're chosen as a clean heat resource under a clean heat standard, 
you're not necessarily given carte blanche. You have to compete against other resources and you compete on price, availability, and carbon intensity, among other things, I imagine. Um, so the race is on. I wanna thank um, the panelists for joining us today. Uh, Rich, Stephen Dodge, Aaron Overturf, Overturf excuse me, um, and Commissioner Gilman. Thank you so much for taking time with us today. This ends the formal webinar, which we run for 60 minutes, but of course, we're gonna stick around for another 30 minutes for Q&A. There are plenty more to go. Again, thank you so much. I know what you do, clap your hands and then we just start. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, we're going into OT, here we are. Stephen, I have a question for you. You use the terms B5, B20, B100, B50. Give us a give us a real quick tutorial on what those things mean, so people can um, understand that a little better. Yeah, I should explain that. Uh, that's it's a great question. So, uh, as I said, renewable diesel is refined. It comes out of the refinery as a renewable uh, as a biofuel. In this area of the country, for a number of different reasons, um, most of the bioheat uh, is blended and it is blended with B100 in various parts. So B100 is neat biofuel. So I would probably guess that most of the heating fuel in the Northeast already is a B5, which would mean 5% bio diesel, 95% petroleum-based diesel. So whether it's B20, which is 20% biodiesel, 20% petroleum-based diesel, B50, whatever, uh, that's what the different blends are. Um, and, and again, that's specifically related to bioheat and biodiesel, uh, which is petroleum-based diesel, diesel blended with a neat, a renewable, low-carbon product. Thank you. So there are a number of questions that really has, people are trying to figure out where to place in, in, uh, in the constellations, where to place a clean heat standard. Um, Here's a question. Do you see a clean heat standard as a policy that would operate instead of or in addition to the kind of fossil fired equipment bans that jurisdictions around the country are adopting? Well, I can start on that one. Um, I see it as um, a complement to the equipment or hookup bands or appliance standards that might be adopted in different places. Uh, the problem with uh, the hookup bands and uh, mandates on new equipment are that you're only affecting the, the new additions to the system. And we really need to go much faster than that. So we need a policy that will uh, reach back into the fuels uh, cycle and also reach into more uh, homes and buildings. Thanks. Any other responses to that? Thanks, Rich. Here's a question for Aaron. Uh, what economic analyses were done before the Colorado CHS was adopted? Yeah, I, I will say that I'm pretty sure, I'm like 99% sure that Colorado was the first state to actually adopt a clean heat standard. So we are in classic Colorado fashion, um, breaking new trail, I think, with implementing this policy and learning lessons along the way. Um, the emission reduction targets in the clean heat standard were taken from the state's roadmap analysis, which was conducted with economy-wide you know, emissions reduction modeling. And then there were a number of studies on beneficial uh, electrification potential and other avenue to reduce emissions from the built environment that were conducted by the Colorado Energy Office in advance of the adoption of that policy. And I put links where you can find both the roadmap and those other studies in the chat box. Great, thank you. It's a question for you, Steve. Uh, Stephen addressed food for biofuel, but can he address deforestation? A huge problem in Indonesia where forests are logged and peatland burned for palm oil, increasingly used for biofuels. Thank you. Sure, uh, good question comes up a lot. Uh, if you remember my little pie chart there, palm oil is not in there. Palm oil is not used in domestically produced biodiesel. And there's a reason for that because it doesn't meet, yep, thank you, does not meet the federal definition of advanced biofuels uh, because of the issues that the person who posed the question uh, mentioned. So. Uh, states can certainly fashion, and I think 
if I remember correctly, the definitions, well, I don't know if the Vermont law got that specific, but um, I think certainly the intent that palm oil based biodiesel would not qualify for any uh, credits under the Vermont plan doesn't qualify as part of the mandated fuels uh, in the states that have mandates. Bottom line is palm oil is not used in the United States. It would not qualify as an advanced biofuel. Uh, it does not under the federal EPA definition and would not under the state's definitions. Thank you. This, this question sort of goes back to maybe a clarification uh, in Richard's discussion, but I think it also would apply to what's going on in um, Nevada and Colorado. Under this structure, could a gas utility become a seller um, of clean solutions or do they invest indirectly by buying credits? I'm happy to, to respond to that one. Thank you. Uh, we certainly in the Vermont uh, legislative uh, process, we envisioned that the this would lead to the transformation of the gas utility, that the gas utilities business model would transition to becoming the supplier of clean heat solutions. Um, some of those might be uh, pipeline solutions, for example. Uh, there's a proposal for a renewables-based district heating system in Burlington, our largest city. Um, some of them could be uh, blended renewable natural gas, but over the long term, um, I think it's envisioned that electrification and weatherization would become much greater fraction of the heating supply in the state, and the um, the gas utility understands that and is prepared to move in that direction. So they they didn't envision that they would just be buying credits from somebody. They envisioned that they would, in fact, themselves be supplying clean heat solutions to end use customers. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, and I'll just say that, you know, the, the Colorado policy is, is different in that the measurement of compliance is really emissions based rather than credit based. So anything that reduces emissions from the gas distribution utilities system um, has the potential to assist them in attaining compliance with the goals. Thank you, Aaron. This question goes out to any of you. Can you talk a little bit about how combined heat and power would be able to participate in a clean heat standard? Do you wanna go first, Rich? Oh, I'll let you go first this time. <laughs> okay, um, well, it strikes me that there's, uh, there's kind of two ways. One is um, the electricity that's produced can obviously be helpful when you're thinking about new loads that are added as we electrify um, end uses that are today powered by the combustion of fossil fuels. Um, the other would be that the Colorado law has a provision in it that um, allows for the innovation and new technologies. So rather than trying to list out every possible thing that could reduce emissions that might exist over the next uh, 40 years, the policy says that the Public Utilities Commission has the authority to approve other alternative compliant mechanisms if they either reduce those direct burner tip emissions or fit within a recovered methane protocol that's approved by the state's air regulator. So that leaves open the possibility for things like district heat solutions that perhaps you can reuse some of that heat to provide heat elsewhere where it needs to be. Those are solutions that could come forward through the clean heat plan process in Colorado as it progresses. The Vermont legislation similarly uh, would permit uh, combined heat and power to earn clean heat credits on the thermal side. As Aaron just pointed out, the electric generation uh, may or may not qualify for renewable energy standard credits uh, under an RPS. But the, the question on the thermal side would be, um, how many tons are avoided by the use of this um, CH, combined heat and power uh, heat load, uh, heat supply, and then what are the life cycle greenhouse gas emission reductions associated with the 
the fuel source. So only on a life cycle basis, but theoretically it's, um, it could be credited. Thank you. Can you address the important role for building shell energy efficiency improvements in this context? It's really big and it, it's a really important uh, at all of all of the energy efficiency measures, I think are a, the, the most important probably um, clean heat resource that can be used to comply. I think they provide extraordinary emission reduction benefits, but also resiliency, comfort, indoor air quality, health and safety benefits. Um, so really see those weatherization um, improvements as a, as a key activity going forward. So I'm gonna chime in to uh, agree with everything Aaron just said um, and with two additional points. Uh, I think it's important that we, that we design our policies to deliver those benefits uh, uh, as much as we can, as early as we can to lower and, and uh, moderate income households uh, who, are who are the folks who have the toughest time actually accomplishing the weatherization, number one. Number two, we need to be realistic about the numbers. Weatherization in the Northeast anyway, um, accomplishes savings, maybe 25% of the heat load of the building that you're weatherizing. And, and becomes increasingly expensive if you wanna get above 25%. And so while we say efficiency first, weatherization first all the time, if we really wanna reduce emissions uh, according to the, the schedules that states have adopted, we're gonna to have to do weatherization plus something else. And that's where a clean heat standard actually addresses both the weatherization side of it and then the next something else side of it as well. David, maybe I'll add one, one thing. Um, I, I would second everything I heard and add one more in terms of um, energy efficiency investment. And that would be system peak demand reduction. So as we look to moving you know, a considerable amount of current natural gas um, demand, like these systems are all built for that peak demand. And so as we look at, especially if we transition these natural gas loads onto the electric system, it certainly begs the question in terms of what the investment is, uh, not only in the generation itself, but in all of the infrastructure it takes to get those electrons to your house. Um, and if we don't invest at all in uh, energy efficiency, it means all of those parts have to be bigger and more expensive and they all peak at the same time. And we're moving to intermittent resources on the electric side, uh, which may struggle. You know, you may be in times where you're relying more on storage um, for these times of peak heating. Um, so especially in a state like Colorado, you know, we have heating loads and cooling loads. Um, and so, uh, you know, looking at moving to potentially being a winter peaking electric utility kind of fundamentally changes how you might think about some of the system design. And so I just think demand reduction is another really important component of why these shell improvements um, are so important. Thank you. So it, in each of your, your presentations and remarks, you, you mentioned um, low and moderate income uh, folks and the effects uh, that this policy might have on them. Um, I just want to toss the question out again so we can sort of get you all to talk about it at the same time. How does a clean heat standard align with equitable an equitable energy transition? What things need to be considered? Well, I can I can start a little bit. I think the one of the most interesting components of the Colorado uh, policy is its directive that the benefits of these investments should flow first to disproportionately impacted communities, which is a defined term here in Colorado, and income qualified residential customers. So to me, that means um, designing policies that are going to deliver both economic and health and indoor air quality benefits to those populations um, that that's the priority as you're sort of deploying these resources. So it will be interesting to see what types of 
plans and programs utilities come forward with to achieve that directive. Um, one thing that I will just note is that the only way that we can assess whether we're successfully um, executing on our equity ambitions is if we're gathering the data that allows us to measure what we're accomplishing. And so figuring out what type of data utilities are going to need to provide in terms of their uh, outreach, how successful that outreach is, what the, what the uptake is, what kind of investment and programs they need to meet customers where they are and meet their needs, I think is gonna be a really important question for regulators going forward. Yeah, I think um, we're, we're moving to get more engagement on this issue, especially in the area of clean heat. Um, we're in the process of scheduling and looking at, you know, hosting kind of workshops around the state in different disproportionately impacted communities to talk about clean heat and how it may impact them. Unfortunately, it's, it's probably a bit of a squishy concept to a lot of people who aren't really involved, right? We don't have exact proposals in front of us, exact costs, but more talking like what does broad success or failure look like? And as Aaron uh, indicated, some of this is enshrined in statute. So what does that mean? What does delivering these benefits, these communities look like, especially when, you know, some resources may have kind of direct benefits. You could kind of understand being able to be prioritized. If you're looking at alternative fuels, what does that look like? You know, is there a prioritization that can happen? So it may differ even by which clean heat resource you're looking at, like what does prioritization mean? Um, so it's something we're in the midst of and trying very hard to, um, accomplish just all sorts of outreach and um, and education and engagement to entire segments of the community that have not typically been involved in our proceedings, who may not be as comfortable uh, in our proceedings and how they engage. Um, so we are very much in the beginning phases of that, but hoping to, to learn a lot and do our best moving forward. Steve and then Richard. Uh, David, I just encourage people to uh, look at a study that we commissioned um, that uh, the second version of it just came out recently, but it was done by Trinity Consultants, which is a uh, internationally known air dispersion modeling uh, uh, firm. And um, they studied originally, I think it was 13 sites throughout the country, uh, all EJ areas. Um, and then I forget what the, the last number was, and I, I'm looking for the results here and I don't have them right with me, but the results are dramatic. And they measured uh, the results of using uh, biodiesel blends uh, in these EJ communities. And the, the, the measurements were in terms of lives saved, uh, reduced number of deaths, reduced asthma attacks, reduced work days, uh, and the results are dramatic. Uh, the, just the use of biodiesel, high biodiesel blends alone for transportation and heating uh, can reduce uh, the adverse effects of petroleum-based diesel dramatically on uh, EJ communities. And I encourage people, if the results are all online, I encourage people to look at that study done by uh, Trinity Consultants. Can, can you explain a little bit more about the, the reduced effects? I mean, are, are there less particulate, is there less particulate matter? Is there less? less yeah. yeah. Uh, co-pollutants like PM, NOx, um, other co-pollutants are dramatically reduced with higher blends of uh, biodiesel. Um, and they were able to equate those into save lives, lost work, uh, you know, less work days lost, asthma attacks, the whole, the whole bit. Trinity Consultants, what year was that study? Uh, well, uh, version two just came out about a month ago. Uh, version one was, I think, 2020. And I'm sorry, I don't have the link. Um, that's that's okay. It, but send us the okay. link. We'll 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 send it out with um, the link to this this webinar. Okay, so people can look at that. So, so yeah, Dave, ahead, you want to move please. on? Yes. I mean, no, Rich, go ahead, well, please. I'm, I'm mostly echoing what everybody has already said. Um, the Vermont legislation um, devoted, you know, the legislative process and that the Climate Council we devoted. Uh, significant attention to the question of equity. And uh, I'd like to add an element to, the, to what has already been said. Um, when I look out at the housing stock or the building stock of any state and realize that by uh, 2050 and 
significantly before then for a lot of it, we're gonna have to um, treat with clean heat solutions, a huge uh, fraction of the building stock. It, I start with the premise that if we're going, we know we need to do that. Why don't we start by focusing attention on the communities and on the households who are the most energy burdened, the most pollution burdened, and whose uh, living and working conditions should be improved first. We're going to know, we know we, it needs to happen. We don't want them to be the last folks who get served. So I just start with the premise that we should design the policies to um, start where the need is greatest. A, a second factor, and it this led, this is you know part of the legislature's thinking about the clean heat standard is that we need to design a standard that that delivers carbon savings without driving prices through the roof. And so we need to ensure that we have solutions in the mix that can be combined in an affordable way. Because um, while we're in the process of cleaning up our thermal sector, um, everybody has to pay those bills. So the flexibility that's inherent in a clean heat standard, as opposed to a pure technology standard, is something that helps us keep costs down. And that also benefits lower income households. Um, I would also add on the, I'm agreeing with you all about the necessity of reaching out to communities who don't normally participate in these kinds of proceedings. The Vermont legislation included the creation of a new equity advisory board to advise the utility commission uh, as the rules are, are gonna be developed. And there's a, uh, the climate council itself is launching new outreach programs to get a broader uh, number of voices in the room. Great, thank you. Uh, great, great responses. So there was a specific question for Richard, a political question about what things could have been done to make to make that legislation pass in Vermont. And I, I do want to toss that question out to you, Richard, but Stevens also talked about legislation that didn't really go the full distance in, um, I think, in Rhode Island and in other states in the Northeast, Nevada. Um, Aaron talked about the Nevada legislation didn't, didn't quite make it through fully through the legislature. Some, some observations about um, the the political battles associated with this, I think might be a, a interesting way to sort of round out this 30 minutes. I'm happy to let other people go first, but if, if you want to, if you want my take on the Vermont story, I'll start. Um, first of all, I think it's, it's important to note that we actually made amazing progress in Vermont with the clean heat standard this year. Um, as some of you may know, we, lost the uh, veto override vote in the House by one vote. Um, we got 99 votes, we needed 100. Um, for a, a new idea and a, a really significant um, change idea, uh, to get that far in one legislative session is regarded in most circles as uh, really unusual. So I think that what we have to learn from that experience is that it takes longer to socialize a complex idea like this, and we need to, um, you know, engage in outreach and education around it. Um, second point, Dave, is that a clean heat standard and a lot of the policies that we all are talking about in the climate arena need to find a middle path between um, the, the forces of the status quo on the one hand and the, the people who passionately want solutions to be really, really, really good. And um, it's not always possible to uh, find a path that's, that attracts enough support in the middle. Um, but the middle is where most of these battles are gonna have to be won. 
Yeah, but could I just add an observation about Vermont? It was kind of interesting. By the way, Rhode Island actually did pass, um, and um, in most of the legislation in the other states is still pending. But back to Vermont, and Richard can correct me if I'm wrong, um, because he lives there, but it was kind of an interesting alliance of progressives that didn't like the fact that renewable fuel, biofuels were in the bill, were eligible for credits. Uh, and that was biodiesel, renewable gas, and I think wood pellets, Richard, if I'm correct. So there was a faction that didn't like the fact that that was included in the bill. And then there was the conservative faction that didn't like the fact that it was potentially costly uh, or there was a cost involved, you know, hidden tax argument, uh, and that it could be a regulatory burden on particular small, particularly small heating oil dealers. So you got those two kind of opposite ends of the spectrum combining. And I think that's what ultimately probably led to the bill's defeat. Um, so it, interesting dynamic in Vermont. Is that what you saw in other states where no. legislation didn't pass no, for other reasons? Because, and I can't speak to Colorado, but for the Northeastern states, we're not there yet. Um, uh, you know, it's still pending legislation or, or pending in the regulatory process. So Vermont really got further than any other state in the Northeast as far as getting a legislative proposal, you know, this close to passing. Thank you. Erin? I guess the only other um, observation that I would make is that one of the most controversial and hard fought components of the Colorado bill was the role of recovered methane um, and what role it had in, in reducing emissions from this um, system. And I think where it landed was um, in a good place that reflects the level of reductions in direct emissions that we need to get from the um, from this sector and from the combustion of these fuels. The, the other thing that I'll just highlight about the Colorado experience interrelates with my greenhouse gas accounting pleas, which is that a number of the um, proposals around the clean heat um, legislation itself, and I would argue even some of the conversations that are still ongoing about it, um, are really attempts to kind of um, expand expand eligibility to um, an extent that really fudges whether those are real emission reductions. So I think um, my my instruction or my my plea for other people who are considering this type of a policy in their states is to be really really diligent about what counts. Um, and to be protecting against double counting everywhere you, you can. Great, well, thank you. Listen, we've come to just about to the end of this half hour. So I'd, I'd like to thank you all again. Commissioner Gilman, I really appreciate you participating. Aaron Overturf from Western Resource Advocates, Stephen Dodge, thank you. Rich Cowart, this has been a really great conversation and um, it looks like there's a lot of work to do. Thank you all for joining us. This was great. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much.